Hi, today we have Professor Jeff Zuckerberg um, who talk about the, future, the past and future of enumerated common code. Uh, thank you for coming. As uh, I, I mentioned, I promised in my abstract to say the last three centuries and the next two. But in fact, the story of enumerative common code is much, much older. It's at least 100 a uh, thousand years old, because what could be simpler than counting? Uh, so the cavemen uh, had to count uh, the children and objects, so <laughs> counting was the very, very basic. But this kind of counting became a counting. Counting, kind of said, possibly a very large one. Uh, if you have lots of money, uh, like Bill Gates, you count a number of dollars to Bill Gates. It's almost infinity, but it's still a finite set. So this is no longer called uh, counting a uh, enumerative commentoid. It's now called a counting, but finite sets. So I will not talk about counting finite sets. But still, it's very, very, very old. And there are two main origins of enumerative commentoids. One of them is sacred, the other is profane. <laughs> so, according to tradition, there is a book called the Book of Creation. The Hebrew mysticism, the Kabbalah. The basic book is the Book of Creation. Uh, also called in Hebrew, Sefer Yetzirah. And it's one of the most profound books uh, ever written. According to tradition, it was written by Petriac Abraham, which is roughly 4,500 years ago. But if you are skeptical and don't believe in tradition, according to historical research, this book at least 300 uh, to the common era. So it's at least uh, 1,700 years old. And this is really a combinatorics book. The whole of the Kabbalah, Hebrew mysticism, is really applied combinatorics trying to find connections, commentary connections, between different things. And there are two different basic notions. One of them is gematria, which is really numerology, finding equivalence between two concepts. Uh, for example, if you can say that the numerical equivalent of your name is the same thing in the numerical equivalent of yourself, of God, then it means you are very important. And one of the paradoxes uh, is in English. That's why English is not a sacred language. In English, even God and dog are anagrams. <laughs> so this proves that English is not an intrinsic language. There is no way that God can be equivalent under the gematria equivalence relation to God. But in Hebrew, uh, you have uh, Kelev and Elohim, there's no way and can be equivalent. But even more important is the anagram. Finding permutation. And if you wanted to uh, be cured, if you had a sickness in those days, you don't go to the doctor. You pray. So you say, please God, help me. But that saying, please God, cure me. It's not enough to be cured. You need all the permutations to say them fast. So please God cure me. Please God me cure. Please, and that may by grammar. God please me cure. You need to do all of them, to list all of them. And then you'll be cured if you have a minor disease. But you have really a major disease, you need to make a much longer sentence. Oh, please my beloved God, <laughs> and then do all the permutations. So it was important to know how many permutations are there with n things. And that one of the quotations in Sefer Yesira, uh, let me read in Hebrew first. Sheva kfulot, it's so fun. Stay avanim, but not snevatim, etc. Two houses, sorry, two stones build two houses. Three stones build six houses. Four stones build 24 houses. Five stones build 120 houses. Six stones build 720 houses. Seven stones build 5,400 
and 40. Sorry, 540 houses. From now on, go and record what the mouth cannot say and the mind cannot uh, record something so big. And Don Knoz, who are otherwise, who is otherwise a very, very smart guy in his art of computer programming in his own Bible, it's also a second text of uh, computer science, the art of computer programming, quoted the things. And he implied that the Sefer Kabbal, Kabbalah didn't, was eight factorial, was beyond the scope of this. <laughs> But of course he was wrong, and I got a uh, two thousand, uh, sorry, two hundred fifty-six cents price for pointing out the error. His error was that they were only interested in the secret itself. They were only interested in going to the OIS and figuring out the the sequence, and they got stumped after a seven factorial. But what happened is the application for finding out it was really the computational complexity. It was a fourth example of a computational complexity. It's an algorithm to get cured. So uh, the more sick you are, the longer phrase you have to do. So you have to do all the permutations. So you have to find the length of how long it would take. So 5040 is still with patience. You can say uh, continuously without eating the same thing. But a factorial, uh, it was beyond the thing. And if you have to be able to, you better give up. Uh, you're probably going to die. So that was the point that you cannot do it. So that's the first example of enumeration. So this is a sacred, holy origin of enumerative commentaries. Unfortunately, there is one much less novel, one much, much more mundane, even immoral, uh, to some people. Gambling. <laughs> Traditionally, probability theory started with some notorious gambler, the Chevalier de Mer, asking a question uh, to uh, Fermat and Pascal, I think. So here was the question. By the way, in the old days, probability was combinatorics. Before it got ruined by later analysts, uh, and in the 20th century by Kolmogorov, who completely ruined probability, made it in a, a branch of analysis, uh, and really, really ugly. In the old days, until roughly uh, the plus, it was a branch of enumeration. The probability of success is a ratio. The number of successes, the set of successful, and the total. So you have to do two enumeration problems. For example, for tossing a coin, if you want to find the probability of having k heads and n minus k tails, you count how many coin tosses are there where you have exactly k heads and n minus k tails. And people found out this is a closed form formula. N choose k and the total number is another enumeration problem. And the ratio was this. And from this you can derive lots of other things. So really discrete probability and probability until the time of Laplace roughly was really enumeration. So here how it started. Savalier, the mayor, had two kinds of gambling problems. One of them was getting at least one six in four rolls. So failure not getting. So what you fail if you're not getting uh, one six. So no six. Okay. So the number of so, so the total number you toss a dime, a die is only six times, a uh, four times. So the universal set is this. So the total number of, if you toss a die uh, four times, the total number of outcomes is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 6, 6, 6, 6, 6. But if you don't get a 6, so number 1, no 6, is 
the Cartesian product of this set, which is 5 to the power 4. So the probability of uh, failure is this. And the probability of success is this. And then, Chevrolet the mayor didn't have a calculator, and he was, by the way, uh, People think of the Chevalier de Mer was being a bum, and that's a, a nobleman who liked to gamble. But it turned out he was a very cultural person, and gambling was just a hobby. He was a, a man of letter. He was not good in mathematics, but that's why he had to ask Pascal and Fermat. But uh, uh, probability and combinatorics started with this thing. So that was one gambling game. And the other one, take uh, two dice, two dice, and roll it. 24 times. So, and not getting, getting at least one double six in uh, 24 times. So this, without a calculator, this you can do by hand. But this, without a calculator, is much harder. But, uh, so my Pascal figured out that uh, this was bigger than this. So this is a, be uh, that's a better game. This. this is a winning game. That's slightly more than 0.5, I forgot exactly. Or oh, that's 0.5, 51%. So in this band, if you play long enough, you'll be a winner. But in this game, that looks maybe superficially a, a better luck, it's 0.49 something. <laughs> so in a long time. So this was the beginning of enumeration in gambling. Also, another notorious gambler was Pepys, and he asked uh, Newton another gambling problem, but uh, and there was another famous problem, the problem of points. Suppose two people play equally well, uh, equally good players play tennis, and uh, another one tennis you have to be two uh, ahead. Okay, uh, they play heads and tails, and the person who gets five first is a winner. But suppose they had to quit, sometimes in the middle. Suppose after, uh, then they got to this. So it's like a random walk. How would they, oh, of course, if they had to quit here, it's much more likely that this guy will make it first than this guy. So you want to divide the stakes. It's one of the beginning of probability, the problem of points. So the way to do it, forget about the history. Of course, you can say that if this guy uh, got the hundred to two, he's much, probably a much better player but it's not a, a game of, I assume they are equally good players, or it's a fair coin, then it's not fair to just split half-half. So the game is equivalent, you move this to the origin, and you ask, what the probability of getting here first, or here first? So once again, you can do binomial coefficients, and the way, uh, I think, uh, Fermat did it, he did the state line here, and say, that can play, even though it's obviously, once you reach here, you won, but never mind, that's for fun, play for fun. And here, in this case, you still keep on playing for fun. So it's equivalent to play, so you have R and S. So, have, so this is the line X plus Y equals R plus S minus Y. So you play the full game, you pretend you play the full game, and then you look at the sum of these outcomes and the sum of these outcomes, and that's how you divide the stakes. So that's another application of combinatorics. So people like to have closed form. So for some problems, you have nice, beautiful closed forms. We already talked about permutations. So a rigorous formula, the traffic theorem did not use algebraic notation. It was implied. They had an algorithm, then n factorial. So implicitly, 
they had this. But the first rigorous proof was given in 1303 CE by a, a rabbi called uh, Ben Gershon, Levi Ben Gershon. And he had a beautiful book called The Book of Number. And it's really a well combinatorics, rigorous treatise. Treatise of, and he had a full proof. He didn't have algebra yet. Everything is in words. So in algorithm, in order to find the number of ways to have all the combinations, you take number one, then you multiply the number of two, number three, but have completely rigorous proof by today's standards, except everything in words. So what today would be written in one line was a whole page to get a rigorous proof that the number of permutation was n of time. But then people start to wonder, what about the number of permutations that have some conditions? What a number of permutation such that pi of i is never equal to i. This is called a derangement. Or in terms of probability, suppose you have n people who hang their heads uh, or hang the coats in the, in, in the court room. And then it's either a power failure or they all get so drunk, they don't know uh, whose hat is what. And they take any hat at random. What the probability that none of them got the hat right? So the number of permutations that have this condition, no fixed points, is called a derangement. And for the derangements, you also have a beautiful formula. Not that beautiful, but as this, but almost as beautiful. First, if you believe in transcendental numbers, here is the most compact formula. Just take e, 2 plus 7, 1, 8, etc. Divide by it, use a calculator, and look at the closest integer. This is uh, the number of derangements. But if you don't like transcendental numbers, this is a close form formula, and factorial, sigma, minus 1 to the k, uh, n to the k, k minus k factorial. And this is a simple consequence, sorry, of the principle of inclusion and exclusion. A nice, not as nice as this one, but still pretty close to formula, a single sum. And this is another answer. A recurrence. N factorial is a shorthand. That's cheating. It's a notation for a solution of the recurrence. D A, sorry, let's call it A. N sub N. is N times M and N minus 1. With the initial condition of 0 equals 1. So this is a shorthand. The answer here is the solution for a first order recurrence with the initial condition of 0 equals 1. So for dn, this is something analogous, but no longer first order. Well, yes and no. This is the first order inhomogeneous equation. And from here, you can, use, you can com compute very easily the first 10,000 terms uh, in no time. And it's also a homogeneous recurrence. This of n is n minus 1. And this m minus 1, just m minus 1, I think. So this is second order recurrence. So not as nice as this, but still, it's an answer. Speaking of answers, Herb Wilf, my great late mentor, had a classical article. What is an answer? In enumeration, you want to find a formula. You want to give an answer. But for any set A,